<laughs> okay, cool. So hopefully this will be very friendly, very clear, and very brief. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you about the isoparametric inequality. Um, there's a first version, which think is, is justifiably famous, and probably many of you have seen. And it says the following thing. If I have a region y in the Euclidean space, which is, say, a bounded open set, and then I look at the boundary of y, um, then if y is a big set, it needs to have a big boundary. Or conversely, if y has a small boundary, then it can't be that big. And that's made more precise in an inequality. It says that the volume of y, the n-dimensional volume of y, is bounded by a constant times the n minus 1-dimensional volume of the boundary raised to an appropriate power, n over n minus 1. And this constant Cn is a kind of complicated number, but the way to think about it is that um, this is sharp when y is a ball. And that fact encodes what this constant is. If you put in y being a ball and z being a sphere and work this out, you'll get a number here. That's the constant. OK. Um, but this isoparametric inequality is only a special case of something a lot more general that I think is less commonly known. Um, and so that's, that's my main goal, is to tell you about this general isoparametric inequality. And what's going to be general about it is, um, OK, so here the two characters are z and y. And z is a hypersurface, a closed hypersurface in the Euclidean space. So for example, if we were in three-dimensional space, z would be a closed regular surface. Um, the general isoparametric inequality has to do with closed surfaces that could have any dimension. So for example, I could have a closed loop in the three-dimensional space like this. And at first, it's not obvious what, what kind of inequality you could have involving the length of this closed loop, because the closed loop does not divide space into two regions. So there's no inside region to play the role of y. But there's a nice thing you can do. You can imagine dipping this loop into soap water and pulling it out. And then there'll be a soap film, which spans the loop. And what the, what the soap film does more mathematically is that it's a surface that tries to minimize its area whilst hugging the, the loop. And the right version of the isoparametric inequality involving the loop is that the area of that soap surface is bounded in terms of the length of the loop. So we can write that in the following way. Um, general isoparametric inequality. So um, if I have a k-dimensional closed surface z, contained in the Euclidean space Rn, um, then there exists a k plus 1 dimensional surface y, k plus 1 dimensional surface y. That's the soap film with the following two properties. Um, the boundary of y is z, so the soap film is spanning the, the loop or the surface. Um, and the volume of y obeys an inequality which is very similar to that one, namely the k plus 1 dimensional volume of y 
is bounded by a constant, CK, times the k-dimensional volume of z raised to an appropriate power. Um, and this is, again, sharp when z is a round k-sphere. And y is, and y is a, a disk, an ordinary disk. OK. Um, I was trying to think as I was preparing this of some sort of example that, um, you know, what sort of example one would worry about. And I'll, sh I'll show an example later on. But one thing I wanted to mention to worry about is that, say we're talking about a two-dimensional surface. This could be in any Rn. So we could have, say, a two-dimensional surface in R a billion. Right? And that's naturally kind of hard to imagine. And the surface maybe could be, be bent in a complicated way that involves all million dimensions. And then in a situation like that, one might be anxious that it would be harder for a soap bubble to fill in that very complicated thing than in it is for a surface in the ordinary Euclidean space. But this theorem says that's not true. Even if z is sitting in a million dimensions, um, it's not any harder to find a small area um, filling than it would be in, in a small number of dimensions. Can I ask a question? Sure. This has to make sense at surface y. So these two things work. But what about other surfaces? Yeah, right. So there exist lots of surfaces y whose boundary is z. And some of them obey this, but most of them don't. Um, so for example, if z is this loop in R3, then um, one surface that it bounds is that disk, which obeys the inequality. Another surface that it bounds is a hemisphere sticking out of the board, um, which isn't quite as good, doesn't quite obey the inequality. Another surface it bounds is a very long sort of ellipsoid sticking out of the board. And that has a, that has a huge area. It doesn't obey the inequality at all. So it's not true that, that yeah, so, it, so only, only well-chosen surfaces will obey this inequality. Yeah? And sharp is only if? Sharp is, it's sharp when z is around sphere and, and only, only when z is around sphere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, let me tell you a little bit about the history. Uh, when I first saw this, I imagined that it might be very old, but it's not very old. And as far as I know, the first people who even formulated the question were Federer and Fleming in 1959. They made up the question and they proved an inequality in this direction, but it isn't sharp. And this was improved over a number of years. And um, this inequality, the, this theorem, the way I've stated it. This is the, yeah, history, thanks. History of the general isoparametric inequality. Yeah. Well, to tell you, I don't know the history of the isoparametric inequality. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, if you go in a Hilbert space, yeah, this would, this would probably still be true, but it might be a little technical. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk a little later about other spaces. Um, so this theorem um, on the bottom board there was only proven in 1986. So I was very surprised when I found out this date at how, how recent it is. Um, so that's the sharp. Um, and I also wanted to mention, uh, so this is, is quite a difficult argument. It's about 100 pages long. And there's um, a very nice thing recently that was done by Stefan Wenger, which is an algorithm. And it's not sharp, but it's kind of n nearly sharp. So an algorithm, basically, you could put into the computer uh, some z, and the algorithm will construct a surface y that has that boundary 
and that obeys not this inequality, but the constant's a little bit worse. OK. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to show you a little bit about how this algorithm works to get a sense of what, what, uh, what the, the difficulties are and what the, what the proof is like. So first I wanted to explain what happens when k is 1. So we're filling a bunch of loops. Um, OK. Now a nice thing about filling a bunch of loops is there, there might be several loops, but we can fill them separately from each other. We can just construct a disk with, with, for each loop. Um, so we can think about them one at a time. And there's a very simple disk that we can construct that does a reasonable job. Namely, we take a point somewhere on the loop, and then we draw lines to all of the other points on the loop, and we produce this kind of fan. Um, and that, that's a disk that fills in the loop. Um, and if you think about how big its area is, its area is made up of a lot of little triangles like that one. Um, and the, the length here is bounded by 1 half L. So L is the total length of Z. Uh, because these are two points on a loop of length at most L. So this distance is at most 1 half L. Um, so that's the sort of height of the triangle. It's going to be about that big. And the base will be, say, d sigma, a little piece of the arc of the circle. And so the area is going to be the integral over z, less than or equal to the integral over z of 1 half l, uh, 1 quarter l, times d sigma, because the area of a triangle is half of the height times the base. This is just a constant that comes out. And when we integrate the arc length around the cycle, what we get is the length of the cycle. So we get 1 quarter l squared. This is a very basic construction, and it gets in the ballpark of the right answer. So the sharp, sharp isoparametric inequality would say that the area of y should be less than 1 over 4 pi l squared. That's better by a factor of pi. Um, but this is not so unreasonable. OK. Now when we go up to two dimensions, when we go up to taking a two-dimensional cycle z, it becomes harder to find a good soap film that fills it in. And um, a typical example, this is sort of the most important example in understanding the isoparametric inequality, is a barbell surface. So this is a two-dimensional surface here that I've drawn that consists of two spheres of medium size connected by a thin tube. Um, so this is my surface z. It could be in R3, but let's imagine that it's in R8 or something like that, which means that it doesn't have a canonical inside region, and we have to find a soap film that fills it in. Um, OK. Maybe each of these has area 1, say. Um, and this tube in the middle may be extremely long. So its length is, is really big, all right, much bigger than 1. Um, and nevertheless, while being extremely long, it doesn't have to have much area. So its area could be less than epsilon. OK. Now imagine I want to fill in this shape. Um, if I try to do what I did up there, I'm going to run into a problem. So I have to pick a point for my cones. I could pick a point, say, over here. And then when I fill in all of those line segments, I'll get a kind of a ball over here, which is not so bad. And I'll get this giant cone over here coming from that thing, which has a base of area 1 and a tremendously long height. And so it has a tremendously long three-dimensional volume. So that won't work. Of course, for this particular picture, you can imagine how to find a soap film that fills it in that does much better. You have a, a ball that fills in each of these spheres. And then you have a solid cylinder uh, that fills in there. Um, but the point I want to make is that in order to do this, you have to look at this somewhat complicated shape and break it up in your mind into simpler shapes, which you know how to fill in. And that's the way Stefan's algorithm works. Um, so Wenger's algorithm 
um, breaks an arbitrary shape. into simpler shapes, simple pieces, and fills them in with cones. OK, so that hopefully gives some flavor of how this subject works, how the inequalities work. Um, so in order for it to be a good idea to fill in a piece with a cone, what you need to know is that the lengths of these segments, which are basically the diameter of the piece, um, cannot be too much bigger than the volume of the piece to the 1 over n. So, and then you can have a fudge factor. You have something like this. So this is, this is a simple piece. So if we have a picture like that, we'd like to make a cut here, fill in a disk. And then that is a simple piece. And we make another one here. And this is a simple piece. And actually, this cylinder, which even though we think of it as being simple, it doesn't, it's not simple by this definition. It has to be broken into a lot of small pieces. So this, that's a simple piece. Yeah, it's not obvious you can break it up. That's right. I mean, yeah. This isn't the whole proof, but it's just a flavor. But I will advertise that the whole proof is only about four pages long. So um, it is something that somebody, I think somebody from any part of math could read it and, and find it accessible. OK. I wanted to end by saying a little bit about isoparametric inequalities in other spaces. Um, there are, lots of, there are lots of different geometric spaces. Um, and one, one philosophy about some of them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So these people up top, they were interested in minimal surfaces, the minimizing object. Um, but it's, I wanted to advertise just that there's an inequality like this. And um, I'm interested, like you said, up to constants. Or the, you know, the, the more accurately you can do it, the better. But at the same time, even something, um, even something rough can be interesting. Yes. Yeah, that's a very different game from this. Yeah, that's right. A big difference between here and here is that there's no downstairs here. There's no symmetrization. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I wanted to say for a minute that there are lots of other spaces. And one philosophy about other spaces is a philosophy from Felix Klein that says that different geometries correspond to different symmetry groups. Um, so we could look, first of all, at Lie groups. Like we could look at SLNR or Heisenberg groups or dot, dot, dot. And for each Lie group, there's a kind of natural geometry associated to it, at least up to constants. And one wants to understand for each group, what is the corresponding isoparametric inequalities. Um, or we could look at symmetric spaces, like um, SLNR modulo SON. Or we could look at locally symmetric spaces, 
like SLNR modulo SON modulo on the other side some discrete subgroup like for example an arithmetic group gamma Q to be the matrices in SLNZ that are congruent to one modulo Q congruent to the identity modulo Q or some other interesting discrete subgroups. Um, so these are natural spaces that come to us sort of from algebra and they have different symmetries and um, it would be interesting to understand the geometry of these spaces um, and uh, at least, at least with, with my background the isoparametric inequality or even better the general isoparametric inequality is like the most fundamental question about the geometry of a space. So it would be really exciting to try to understand those things. Uh, so there are some, some things that are known and some things that aren't known about these spaces. Uh, okay, I should stop there. Um, yeah, so for the Heisenberg group, uh, it's not exact, um, but for, so for the, this kind of, let's call this a classical isoparametric inequality. Um, classical isoparametric inequalities on, on the Heisenberg group were done, uh, yeah, by, I, I'm not positive about the author, but that's been done, and the higher co-dimension ones have been done more recently by Robert Young. Um, and so, so one has a pretty good picture of the Heisenberg group. Sorry? The next one also a local Yeah, here, here are, right, a lot of these are maybe not, this space actually might be easy. In this space, maybe you can just take a cone. So by being done, you mean you always get a company with the same power, so with different constants? No, the powers also depend on the space. Um, so, for example, um, if you look in the three-dimensional Heisenberg group, and in the classical isoparametric inequality, um, then the three-dimensional volume of Y will be bounded, bounded by some constant times the two-dimensional volume of Z, but the power here will be four-thirds, as though it were a four you know, the same power as you would have in R4, even though the dimension is three. Um, in SLNR, you would have a linear factor here. So each of these different kinds of symmetries produces a different geometry where qualitatively different isoparametric inequalities happen. Supposing you just uh, had a, some kind of general metric, uh, not of any particular symmetry in, uh, in RN, and then maybe there would be an isoparametric inequality, but Yeah, so for, for, less, yeah, for less symmetric spaces, it's interesting to try to figure out what happens. Um, one problem is you could be given a space and, and a computer, and the computer can try to figure out what the best isoparametric inequality is in that space. Or you could just know, you, know, you could look at, say, all two spheres with area one and ask, just based on that information, can you have some isoparametric inequality? Um, or, or maybe other questions. Did that answer your, or I, I don't know if that was a. Well, I'm just curious, maybe, you know, if that maybe that hasn't been thought of yet, or uh, um, it doesn't seem to be a natural question. Uh, doing some kind of inequality in a general metric uh, in RN. Yeah, okay, so, so say we have a general metric in RN. Um, one thing you could ask is, is, is there an inequality that's true for all of the different metrics? Which would be very general. Right? Um, but so, that's not true. There's no universal isoparametric inequality that's true in every metric. Um, and then after seeing that, one could ask, are there some nice classes of metrics that you know, have you, something easily checked? And for all of those metrics, there's a nice isoparametric inequality. 
And there are various theorems about this because that that's a, could go in a lot of directions. There's a question back there. Yes. The general of the surface inequality, you don't need any regularity assumption on the surface to know that it's a sharp or loop or Um Yeah, that's right. So morally, suppose I have a suppose I have a surface with a corner or something like that. Um, then you could smooth out the corner, and you would have something that looks like that. And the smoothed out version would actually be a little better than the version with the corner. Or you could imagine you have like a really crazy surface. Um, but this really crazy surface is wasting a lot of volume doing all of that business. Um, and those are far from, far from the worst case. Is there a general theorem that the mean area should be changed over the direction? I mean, uh, it should be changing on, I mean, from what you're saying there. Um, so if you, if you fix z, and look at the minimizer for y. That's a minimal surface. And there's an extensive and kind of complicated theory about regularity of that. Almgren asked to, to do his thing. He asked another question, which is, so for each z, you, you could associate the volume it takes to fill it. And then you want to find the z, which is the hardest to fill. And he, he had to study the regularity of that um, and also prove a little something. Um, no, there's no symmetrization argument at some point. Uh, Ongren's argument is the following. You the the shop, right? What is it? That's the one that's sharp. Yeah, that's right. So you start with some shape, and you don't really know what it is. Um, but then he wants to improve it a little bit. Um, so we'd like to, um, instead of filling the whole thing in, just fill in a little bit, and then we'll have a nearby surface. It looks like this. Um, and when we, when we do that, we want to figure out how to, how to fill in a little bit so that we reduce the volume of z as much as possible <coughs> given uh, the uh, fixed volume of this pink part. Um, and so the way you do that is you find the part of z where the mean curvature is the biggest and you push it in. But is there a flow? Yeah, there's a natural. That's right. There's a natural flow. The flow is a little less regular than some flows that people than some flows that people commonly look at because you you just push in on the one spot where the mean curvature is the biggest. So it's a it's it's a little irregular as a flow, um, but at least formally that's the flow. Um, and then if it's round, you're pushing in evenly everywhere. And if it's not the round sphere, you're changing its shape. And Omgren checks that you're improving its shape. That's not that hard. But then it's really hard to prove that this flow sort of converges morally to it, converges to a sphere. Um, and I don't understand that part. That's, that's a very technical part of the argument. So this algorithm, uh, there's no algorithm That's right. The algorithm isn't really sharp, and uh, it sounds There's no way to make it sharp. I mean, nobody tried to prove it, so you could get something better. That's right. Nobody's, no, yeah, nobody's tried seriously. Probably nobody hopes to have an algorithm that gets the sharp. So you cannot do it by, 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 by show the fixed point guy argument? Say you have a predation again or something, can you do it? Say we can map in a shape to another shape or something. Or to show the relation is not there. So I don't really prove that there is a um, there's a there's n some kind of compactness. <coughs> yeah. So is, is that saying that even if say z is a c infinity manifold, there's many examples where where there's no no y at all that's not singular, it's not even c. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. I was thinking of including a discussion of what is a surface. <laughs> right. So. Right, so z could be a c infinity manifold, and it has the property that there is no manifold with boundary that has that boundary at all. And so y needs to have some, some singularities. Um, like, uh, yeah. Um, 
Um, and that shows that minimal surfaces are not perfectly regular. But they obey what's called partial regularity, which means that they don't have, in some sense, too many singularities. Or the, sing the dimension of the singularities isn't too big. Okay, I feel like it's probably time to have some drinks now. Thank <laughs> you.